We are moving right now to Morgan Heslop uh, presentation. Morgan is a PhD student at Maisie University in New Zealand. And his presentation is, is entitled Lessons from the Boardroom, Applying Concepts of Boredom to Animals. I love, <laughs> I love, uh, I, I, I look forward to learning about this topic. <laughs> thank you. And thank you for having me. Uh, I'm really excited to be here. And um, I think I'm going to take a slightly list, lift field approach uh, to boredom from what we've heard about so far today. But um, I'm really excited to get some new perspectives on the ways I've been thinking as well. So I'll pop this up. Okay, is that working? Okay, yeah. fabulous. So every year, billions of dollars are spent across the world on preventing boredom in animals, not only for our pets, but also for animals in zoos, research facilities, and on farms. In the US alone, the pet toy market is projected to grow to $12 billion before the end of the decade. And we spend this money because for years, we've been told that buying toys will fix the problem of boredom for our animals. But what if I told you that all of this money is being spent to solve a problem that we haven't actually defined? You see, we don't know much at all about boredom in animals which animals have it, what factors cause it, how to effectively solve it, or if it's even a problem in the first place. But given the potential economic and welfare impacts, it is well worth exploring. So kia ora, hello, uh, I'm Morgan. Uh, as we've already heard, I'm a PhD student from the Animal Welfare Science and Bioethics Center at Massey University in New Zealand. And today I want to talk you through how I have approached these questions around boredom and animals um, from my perspective as an animal welfare scientist. So in order to explain how to do that, I first want to explain how we approach mental states in animals more broadly. Uh, so my key interest as a welfare scientist uh, in boredom is understanding what boredom means for the welfare of animals. Uh, in welfare, we think about the environment that animals are kept in, the health of their body, and the way that they feel. These three things all interact together and influence each other, so we can't cleanly separate them, and we need to think about all of them to understand welfare. Now, people tend to approach and understand welfare a little bit differently, depending on their background and personal morals. So it's not uncommon to see researchers place emphasis on one of these aspects over the other. And from a research perspective, that's really useful because we need to understand all of them. But ultimately, from an ethical perspective, welfare holds value because animals can experience good and bad or pleasure and suffering. So in welfare, we are ultimately trying to understand the lives of animals from the perspective of the animals themselves. And that leads us to the fun part of welfare science, which is trying to understand what is going on inside animal minds. So when we start to try to understand whether boredom is a welfare problem, the first thing we need to understand is that in welfare science, we assign moral value to mental states. We make a decision about whether a particular mental state is good or bad for welfare. And we do this because it supports us in making decisions about how we treat and keep animals. So if we have decided that pain is bad for an animal's welfare, then we can um, accept that we have a duty to prevent and mitigate pain where possible. And this allows us to make decisions and create strategies and policies to uh, protect animals from pain. But generally speaking, uh, we have a strong focus on valence when we assign that moral value. 
So if something is negatively valenced, like pain, then we say the, in, the animal has an interest in avoiding or mitigating that thing. Uh, so therefore it's bad for welfare. From this perspective, we consider boredom to be a welfare problem, but this is only half the answer. It's all very good and well to say that boredom is negative, but what if animals don't have it? Now, do we have robust evidence that animals get bored? Well, the short answer is no, but that's largely because this is a very new focus in our discipline and there is a lot more research that needs to be done. And I think the long answer is where things get interesting. So I'm going to show you some pictures of animals that are kept in very standard common conditions. And you could probably find animals in these kinds of conditions all around the world. And when you have a look at these pictures, I want you to think about if you saw that animal, would you be concerned that that animal could become bored? So we have a horse in a stable, uh, chickens in a cage, a dog being kept in a crate while it recovers from an injury, a tiger in a zoo enclosure, and mice in standard laboratory housing conditions. So the reason I wanted to show you these pictures is to show you the kind of broad variety of different states in which I've had people tell me they think animals are bored. And this leads us to the long answer. Uh, and that's that we as humans look at situations like this and think that these animals might be bored. And because we don't have robust evidence suggesting that it isn't, uh, we have a duty to explore this further and ensure that the ways that we keep animals aren't harming them. But these are all very different situations. So what is it about them that makes us worry about boredom specifically? To answer that, let's take a quick look at situations that humans find boredom boring. Now, of course, there's large individual variation in this, and there are a lot of different places and ways that we can get bored. But there seem to be uh, a few situations that we really strongly associate with boredom. Uh, and those are places like schools and the workplace and also driving, specifically long haul driving. So if we compare that to these situations in which we're worried about animals, we're thinking about farrowing crates for sows, battery cages for hens or kennels and stables, and we can actually see at least two key factors um, that seem to be consistent across these environments that we as humans connect with boredom. And those are a high degree of monotony and a low degree of agency. So hold on to those factors and I'll come back to them in a minute. But for now, this begs the question of whether boredom is an animal welfare problem or if it's something that applies to the human experience that we are projecting onto animals. But how can we figure out which one of those it is? So here is how we approach this problem in animal welfare science. We call this Dawkins Bridge and it crosses the divide between the things that we can observe and the things that we need to infer. So on the right there are the mental states, feelings or emotions. These are all subjective. So there's no way for us to directly observe or measure them. On the other side are what we call welfare indicators. These are all of the things that we can observe and measure, including behavior, physiology, and aspects of the external environment. So we treat each of these like a brick and we add them to our bridge. One brick can't cross this divide all on its own. So we aim to use a range of indicators to strengthen our bridge as much as possible. A strong bridge with lots of bricks gives us more confidence in inferring a mental state. So let's have a quick look at how we do this with a really well-established, well-understood example, and that's pain. We've been studying pain in animals for decades. We know a lot about how it works. We know about the specialized nerve cells or nociceptors uh, that sense painful stimuli. We can trace the neural pathways from those nociceptors to central processing units in the brain, and we can watch them activate using imaging techniques. 
Uh, we also know what kinds of behaviors and physiological changes uh, align with pain. So if we want to know whether an animal is experiencing pain, there are a range of well-established indicators that we can use. Often we'll start with behaviors like facial expressions. So we'll see a change in the animal's face that kind of twigs us and makes us think, maybe I need to look closer, this animal might be in pain. Then we'll start looking more holistically at their behavior and we'll often see protective behaviors. This often looks like aggression or avoidance and hiding to try and increase the distance um, from the animal. We'll also often see pain directed behaviors. So this might look like uh, licking or nosing at a sore area. Then we'll have a look at the animal's body itself. So we'll look for signs of injury or pathologies that might be causing pain. And we'll check the environment for any particular hazards that may have caused injury um, or created those pathologies. And so by the time we've done all of this, we have gathered together uh, a whole range of bricks to build our bridge with. Now we can't ever complete our bridge. Ultimately, mental states are still subjective. So our aim here isn't to have uh, complete certainty over the mental state of an animal. It's to try and be as confident as possible that we are inferring the mental state appropriately. So how do we apply this to boredom? Well, boredom is quite challenging because as far as we understand currently, there's no nice, clear physiological pathway for us to just follow. Um, and it's not caused by direct sensory input uh, in the way that pain is. So when we're thinking about animal boredom, we can't go straight to linking physiological changes to mental states. So I have started instead by examining the way that we think about boredom in humans and looking for behavioral indicators based on that that might be applicable to animals. So here's a broad characterization of boredom based on what I've seen in the human literature and I want to note here that I'm not trying to define boredom but just to pull out some of the key factors that human boredom researchers seem to find important to the experience of boredom and this gives us some interesting directions for finding indicators because we can look for these things in animals so aversion attention arousal even meaning uh, we can interpret as something that is valuable to animals uh, and goal pursuit. And using something like this, we can pull out a few potential indicators that we could develop. Uh, so we could look at a, signs of aversion, goal switching, distraction, uh, and we could think about lost situational meaning, but we might do this using different language. So you might hear something like uh, motivation here instead. But there are some problems with these indicators. The first one is that we can't corroborate these indicators with self-report in animals. So an animal might show these signs, but we can't ask them, are you doing this because you're bored or because of something else? And because we have or currently have a limited number of possible ind indicators, we have a low confidence that we can use these to accurately infer boredom. And that will change as further research comes out. Uh, but at the moment, what we're trying to do is find a good solid foundation to uh, build future research off of. The last problem comes up when we think about the environments in which we're concerned about animals. So um, often th these environments have a high degree of restriction. Uh, and you'll notice that with the exception of aversion, all of these indicators relate to goal-oriented behavior. But the environments in which we're keeping animals often don't provide for a lot of goal-oriented behavior. So focusing here uh, removes us a little bit from that welfare context. So my feeling about this is that exploring these could be really interesting and could tell us uh, important things about whether animals respond to boring environments in a way that's similar to the human idea of boredom. But this leads me to ask whether that's really our question. It's an interesting one, but from a welfare perspective, I think we're actually less worried about animals being specifically bored 
and more worried that animals are having a bad time in certain situations that we think of as boring. Even if that experience isn't directly analogous to what we would think of as boredom. So I think uh, there's a better place for us to start with uh, and we can move into this as we come to understand uh, animal boredom more. And I think that better place to start with is to go back to that environment. Uh, so I noted a little bit earlier that there were two important factors that seem to be consistent across environments that we're concerned about. And those are monotony, by which I'm talking about a high degree of sameness or repetition or a lack of change in the environment. And agency, uh, by which I mean the animal's ability to have control over its environment and make choices about its life. Now, as I understand it, uh, I think this is a slightly different way of thinking about agency compared to the kind of philosophical idea. So rather than talking here about the inherent biological capability of taking that control, uh, we think about this as the extent to which the environment restricts the animal from using whatever ability they have. So I want to quickly show you um, how understanding these two factors can help us to more efficiently uh, understand and improve welfare in these environments. So here's a situation that we would typically think of as very boring for a dog. This dog is confined to a crate all day while its owner goes away to work. And we're worried that this dog is having a bad time, so we wanna do something to improve its day. Typically, owners will do something like turn on the TV or give the dog a toy. So let's look at turning on the TV. Now, presuming that the TV is playing different TV shows all day, this could be a really useful way to uh, lower that monotony and provide some stimulation for the animal. But the animal still has low agency in this situation. Maybe the dog doesn't want to watch TV or the noises are irritating or sounds are distracting. So uh, we need to think about the agency here, not just the monotony. Now we could fix this if we gave the dog a TV remote and trained him how to use it. This would allow him to adjust the volume, change the channel, or just turn the TV off if he doesn't want to watch. And that will increase his agency, but there's maybe not so many owners who are that keen on training their dog to use a TV remote. So the other option could be to give the dog a few different toys. This would increase the dog's agency because it can make choices about which toys to interact with and prioritize its actions. But the situation will become monotonous again if those toys aren't regularly changed. So because we know that, we can give the dog multiple toys on a changing rotation. So you can see how we can make our interventions more targeted and more effective if we understand the environmental features that are at play. But there are a lot of outstanding questions here, like how often would those toys need to be changed? Does the owner need to come home every hour to give him a new toy? Or can you leave the same thing with him for a week and he'll be all right? Or does giving the animal a yes, no choice like TV on and off work well enough? Or should we let them choose between options like changing the channel? So this is where my focus is shifting, is towards understanding how animals perceive monotony uh, there's a really large knowledge gap in this area. Uh, we know that animals uh, prefer, will avoid monotony if they're given the option, but we know very little about how different forms of monotony are perceived by them, whether they're all equal or whether there are a lot of changes uh, and how that works across different species. Uh, we also need to know more about how monotony and agency interact in these environments. So I wanna look more closely in this area and that's where I'm kind of heading um, with the late stages of my thesis. So before I end, I just would like to quickly thank my wonderful supervisors who have allowed me to spend a PhD thinking about these big ideas uh, and our fantastic technicians who are helping me to develop a behavioral paradigm and some custom equipment so that in the future I can explore some of my ideas empirically. Um, thank you for your time and attention and I look forward to hearing your perspectives. It's always nice to see cats uh, in their presentations. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> OK, 
Okay, yeah, it's, it's, it's time for questions. I'm sorry we, we have a lot of them because this is a topic that is rocking <laughs> in boredom studies right now, I'm sure. So, James, you are the first, the first one. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for a great presentation, Morgan. Really interesting stuff. Yeah. Um, are you aware of Georgia Mason and Rebecca Meager's work with Mink? I am. Yes, it's some of, I mean, I think it's possibly the only empirical work that directly um, looks at this idea of boredom in animals and they've taken uh, a slightly different approach where they have gone and looked at the behaviors of the mink so they're looking specifically at um, sensation seeking and awake inactivity um, i've chosen to focus more on the environment that those animals are in um, and it's something that comes up a lot in um, the kind of animal enrichment space where we'll often see in research um, researchers will choose to have an enriched um, treatment and a non-enriched treatment. But when they say enriched, there's all, often this kind of conflation between this monotony factor and the agency factor. And I'm interested in pulling those apart a little bit more uh, because when we keep animals, there will always be some aspect of uh, restricted agency purely from the fact that we are keeping them and we have we take some control over their lives. But monotony is something that we can possibly address quite easily. So if we can pull those apart a little bit, um, then we might have something that we can use for these animals that, uh, you know, maybe we can't control their agency. So yeah, I, I totally agree that um, looking at these things, and it's, it's exciting that you're going to be looking at agency on that, that front. Um, I did present something yesterday for, um, from a group I can send you the paper too, where they had mice in it, mice in empty rooms or or in rooms with enrichment, and in both rooms they could they could poke their nose through a hole to receive an air puff to the nose, which is aversive to the mice. And so they have agency in that paper; they can decide to or not poke their hole through the nose. And of course, in the empty room, they do. I think the empty room is going to be more monotonous, um, but with that agency, they seek out that aversive stimulus. The question I really wanted to ask you though is that. So um, I had a conversation with Georgia Mason um, about, you know, what, do you think all animals are capable of experience boredom? And her response to me was that she thinks no, and that it might be tied a little bit to intelligence. Now, it's not really tied to intelligence in humans. And I think an, another aspect of it might be instead what Charlotte Byrne calls um, neophilia. So the extent to which the animal is interested in novelty do you have any thoughts about that in terms of the context of monotony and agency in animals? Yeah, I do. Um, specifically, I would talk more to monotony because it's something I've spent a bit more time thinking about at, uh, at this stage. But I would tend to agree that there are certain animals that are more likely to, um, to find monotony important in their environment in a way that they find it aversive. Um, so my background is initially in zoology. So I come at this kind of from an evolutionary perspective. Uh, and my feeling is that the animals that are most likely to see monotony as aversive are animals that have evolved to take advantage of change in their mm. environment. And so that will generally be generalists. And I think that's one of the reasons why humans possibly find it so important because we are generalists. Um, what, what, and, can I, sorry to interrupt you. What do you mean by generalist? Sure. So um, I think maybe the easiest way to explain that is to look at the opposite, which is a specialist. Hmm. So a specialist species would be something like a hummingbird. This is an hmm. animal that has evolved into a very particular niche and they have very specialized uh, morphological and behavioral features that allow them to exist in this very specific niche. So if you're a hummingbird and you have evolved specifically to take nectar from one specific flower, then there is no advantage to you in noticing that you are mm. taking from the same flower every single day. And certainly you don't want to get bored of that because that's the only way you can get food. Uh, on the other hand, if you're a rat and you have evolved to take whatever opportunity comes to you, then uh, you have an advantage in seeking out opportunities to exploit new niches. So um, it's maybe maladaptive for you to continue doing the same thing day in and day out. So you might notice that monotony more and work to avoid it um, and seek opportunities. 
Yeah, fascinating. I don't want to commandeer the rest of the sort of questions, but you know, that prompts me to, to wonder: is the octopus a generalist or, or a uh, or a specialist? And and some some of the interesting stuff. Uh, Peter Godfrey Smith is a philosopher that talks about consciousness in the octopus and and other cephalopods, and and there it starts to sort of bring into th to to play here too to other things like body plan and ecological niche as a as a driver. He doesn't want to talk about boredom, but as a a driver for potentially neophilia. And the the more curious a species is the more interested they are in novelty the more i think they probably open themselves up to boredom um, but really fascinating work thanks for your presentation thank you for your comments thank you james and, and morgan some of us are worried about our pets i think <laughs> so who can who can this apply to to our pets because we also have them in cages in, at home in reduced spaces. I know my cat gets bored many times a day. I, I want to protect my pets, having them in a safe environment with food, water. I try, I try to change their food from time to time, but, but the vet told me it was not so, such a good idea. So maybe they are having a bad time as a result of boredom, of having everything done. They, they don't need to do anything on, on, on themselves. So in line with this, Tony was asking, what responsibility do we humans have in the boredom of our pets? Are we condemning them for using them to avoid our own boredom by taking them away from their natural environment. Yeah, I'm mean, so it's a big and practical and boredom is fabulous. <laughs> yeah, so um, I mean, I would be lying if I said this wasn't something I worried about. You know, every morning when I leave my dog in the backyard, um, uh, and I think you know this is this is a really good reason um, why we should be promoting more of this research and be exploring these oh. questions more because I think a lot of people worry about this. And, you know, we have certain, what we would call interventions or certain things that you can do um, that say your vet might recommend. And usually that's things like giving them toys um, or you're taking your dog for a walk every day and that kind of thing. Um, but, I think these interventions could be uh, more targeted and more efficient if we understood exactly what it was we were trying to solve with them. Uh, in terms of our responsibilities, I think there's a couple of different ways of answering that question. The first one, of course, uh, is our legal responsibilities. And that is something that varies country by country. And if it's something you're worried about, most countries have policies and guides available that you can look into to see exactly what you're expected to do for your animals. But if we take the assumption that all of us are already going over and above the bare minimum of what we need to do for our animals, um, I think we have a responsibility to think about it and to be inquisitive about it and make changes where we have evidence that we should do so. Um, but, you know, currently we're still building that evidence and trying to understand what those changes should be. So uh, at the moment, I would only suggest um, that you should provide uh, safe uh, changes for your animal you can, whether that's maybe walking your dog down a different road or taking them to a different park, giving them new toys. Um, and just kind of, I think when it comes to pets, we are all doing our best already. Um, so it's just taking the evidence as it comes and continuing to do our best. So we should be, we should feel ourselves bad when we think that of, I don't have time to play with you, my lovely cat <laughs> or my lovely pet, right? I mean, I don't want to say it, but uh, maybe we should be. Um, are, we, are, are we being bad parents after all? <laughs> I'm a little afraid to answer that. <laughs> I don't want to call anyone a bad pet parent, but I, I think we do need to think about um, the time that we're spending with our animals. And to be perfectly fair, uh, not all of our animals value their time with us mm -hmm. as much as we value yeah, our time with so. them. So maybe you don't need to feel completely guilty, um, but <laughs> certainly. Anyways, know, anyways, maybe we can apply this 
slogan we we as we are used to used to see in the media don't worry about not spending as much time with your pet as you wanted <laughs> because it's good for your pets to get bored they are going to be more creative yeah, maybe <laughs> maybe they're doing some quality mind wandering oh okay uh, it's a pity but we we need to to move to the next to the next speaker it was very nice to to learn about this topic morgan thank you very much thank you